Hi everyone, my name is Shelby and tonight we're gonna to be reading chapters 15 and 16 from Raiders of the Sea. Chapter 15, Future Wealth. In late afternoon, the peaks of Scotland faded into gray mist. As the wind picked up, the choppy water changed into hills and valleys. Behind Bree, the large sail of the Viking ship billowed in the wind. As far as she could see, waves moved up and down. When Bree started feeling empty inside, she thought she was hungry. Then she thought how strange that was. I just ate all I could. I'm filled up. As the waves became long swells, the seabird sliced through them. But Bree's stomach churned. Swallowing hard, she tried to feel the wind in her face. Instead, food rose in her throat and she ran for the side of the boat. Even when there was no more to lose, she stood there, helpless in her seasickness. By now, other Irish folk had joined her. Filled with misery, they lined the sides of the ship. When Michael passed behind Bree, she was only dimly aware of his being there. Sure, and if the lass ain't losing all her pride now, she told herself, guessing at Michael's scorn. Almost she could hear him. What's this big talk you have, Irish lass? You who thinks you are so strong? Desperately clinging to anything that would return her stomach to normal, Bree thought of ma'am and daddy, of Dev, Adam, and the girls, nestled like a bird beside the kitchen fire. But now Bree felt so weak she could barely hang on. Every roll and dip of the ship brought fresh agony. When Michael came offering water, she took a sip but could not keep it down. More than once he returned offering water. Each time she took a drink, she lost it over the side of the boat. Finally, he said, just hold it in your mouth. Even that did not work. So exhausted that she no longer cared what happened to her, Bree dropped to the deck. The next time Michael returned with water, she turned her face away, refusing to open her mouth, refusing most of all to take anything from his hand. And then Bree lost track of time. The darkness of a night, a day, and another night passed before she woke in the greenness, before the dawn of another day. From far off, Bree heard a voice telling her to set down her feet. When she tried to walk, her legs wouldn't work, but two people walked with her. On one side was her friend, Nola. To Bree's surprise, the other person was Michael. With strong arms, they led her back to the sea chest closest to the steering oar. At first, Bree just sat there, so weak she could barely move. When another Viking stepped aside, Michael took the long handle of the steering oar. In the growing light before sunrise, he stood behind Bree, guiding the ship. After a time, he bent down and spoke in a low voice. No matter how much you hate me, there's something you should see. Look beyond the sail off to the horizon. See the edge of the world? Bree saw it all right. Between her and that horizon, waves rolled and pitched without end. Swallowing hard, she told herself she had nothing more to give to the sea. But now Michael said, Take the tiller, the handle, steer toward the edge of the world. Uh-huh, Bree thought, I'd rather steer you out of this world. Go on, take the tiller, Michael said. Too sick to spit out the anger she felt, Bree sat there. See the edge of the world, Michael asked. When we get there, we'll fall right off. He was teasing now, Bree felt sure. At least she thought he was teasing. But then again, maybe he wasn't. More than once she'd heard that the earth was flat, could they really sail right off the edge? Suddenly her stomach turned over, gagging she leaned over the side of the ship. But there was nothing more to come, not even water. From behind, Bree heard a snicker. When she looked up at Michael, she felt even more angry. Then she realized he wasn't the one who had laughed. I'm sorry, Bree, Michael said. I was teasing. You won't fall off the edge of the earth. You're sure? Not between here and Norway anyway. So between here and what? Bree hated herself for for the scared sound of her voice. Not between here and anywhere that Vikings sail. No Viking ship has come to the edge of the world. Michael shook his head. For the first time, Bree felt better. That's too bad. To her surprise, Michael laughed. The next minute, he became a stern teacher. Move over, he said, until she slid closer to the long handle. Look over the side of the ship. See how the tiller goes down to that long blade? That's the steering oar that turns the ship. Before long, Michael had Bree's full attention. As the morning mist fell away, Bree followed Michael's instructions. 
Making small changes, she learned how quickly the seabird responded. When rose-colored light filled the eastern sky, Michael pointed out the far-off line where sky and water met. Bree barely noticed when he handed her a dipper, and the sip of water she took stayed down. After a number of smaller sips, she found she could take a longer drink. Then Michael handed her a piece of flatbread. When he started eating his own piece, she began nibbling hers. Before long, Bree realized that her stomach felt normal for the first time in what seemed like years. Did you bring me back here on purpose? She asked. Michael nodded. You knew that if I looked at the horizon, I'd feel better. Again, Michael nodded. Some people do. Thank you, Michael, Bree said. I wouldn't have made it. He grinned. I know. I'm just protecting my future wealth. Bree choked. Your future wealth? What you're worth to me. Suddenly, all of Bree's anger returned and with a fiery desire to hurt. Not what I'm worth as a human being. As though she had hit him, Michael drew back. He was surprised at her honesty. Bree knew, surprised at her understanding of what could happen. When he started to speak, Bree cut him off. You say your mother needs me as a slave. Is that really true? If you sold me, you'd get a lot of money. A cold mask slid down over Michael's face. Of course. Even his voice sounded stiff, but Bree's words were hot with anger. And you want that price to be high? So you're not taking any chances on my health. Michael gave a straight answer. My father built this ship for me. When I return, I must pay him what I owe. So angry now that she could not even speak, Bree stood up. Her arm hit the handle of the steering oar and the ship changed its course. Reaching out, Michael righted the tiller. By the time the seabird held steady, Bree was halfway up the ship. Come back, Michael ordered, leaving no room for her to disobey. When Bree returned, he said, if you feel sick again, look at the horizon. So I protect your future wealth. Bitterness filled Bree's voice, but his eyes held hers as he nodded. So you protect my wealth. As Bree started off again, a storm of tears rose within her. For a few minutes, she had forgotten where she was, forgotten that the Viking who helped her get go beyond seasickness was not a new friend but an enemy and the land she would soon enter he would be a lifelong enemy her dread of that world filled brie with pain again michael had broken her trust her willingness to hope that even he could do good things for others but then brie remembered i don't have to trust michael for my future my trust is in god suddenly brie whirled around marched straight up to Michael and spoke into his face. I don't believe you, she said. There's a small part of you, a very small part of you that is kind, whether you know it or not. Chapter 16, The Warning. As the stars came out, Devin and Jeremy left the path along the Irish coast. Climbing like nimble goats, they passed over the small bridge of land. Beyond was a wide plateau of grass-covered rock. On the side toward the sea, the land sloped upward before dropping to the water, forming a natural wall against the wind and the waves. No danger there, thought Devin, no falling into the sea. On the side toward land, the rock rose higher, shielding them from view. At the center of their hiding place, Moss covered the rocky trail. Wrapping his cloak around him, Devin lay down in the soft hollow. Nearby, Jeremy settled himself on the blanket given to them by the O'Neills. Laying on his back, Devin looked up at the stars. Right above him, they were coming out one by one. As the sky grew darker, the stars grew brighter. With nothing to limit his view, the night sky seemed bigger than it, than he had ever known. Devin felt as if he could reach up and touch God. To his surprise, there was something he knew. As awful as the past few days have been, they could have been even worse. Sorry. When he was totally confused, not understanding what was wrong with him, Jeremy had found him. When they needed a place to stay, they had found the O'Neills. The family had given them a, fire, a warm fire, food, bed, and clothes. When he and Jeremy needed a place to sleep, God had shown them what to do. Often, Devin didn't take time to pray. Usually, he told himself that was Brother Cronin's job. But now Devin couldn't get the Glendalo monk out of his mind. He said I was a born leader, but I couldn't take care of Bree. It's my fault that she was stolen away by Vikings. Since standing up to the mean boy next door, Devin had known how to win. 
And when he did, in every contest with lads his age, Devin stood at the top. With nearly everything he tried, Devin succeeded, until now, when it counted most. Still, looking up at the stars, Devin started to pray. I'm not a leader, God. Not like Brother Cronin thinks. A leader needs to be strong, able to stand up to things, able to win. Right now, I just want to give up. In the next moment, Devin heard it. The sound of the sea had been in his ears all day, but this was different. First, a soft swish, then a whooshing like the wind rushing into a narrow space. Then the roaring crash of water against rock. In spite of, in spite of his tiredness, Devin crept toward the sound of the waves. Lying flat on his stomach, he peered over the edge. The sea had found its way into a rocky ravine about 15 feet wide and 20 feet long. Each time the waves rolled in, they lead, leaped up the rocks. In the thin light of the stars, the white foam of the sea turned silver as it crashed against the rocks. Devin felt its spray against his face, tasted its salt on his lips, and knew the sea was a living thing. When he returned to the hollow in the rock, Jeremy was asleep. Lying on his back, Devin looked up at the stars. Though the dampness of the ground crept through his cloak, he felt strangely warm inside. As a cloud drifted across the stars, a childhood memory drifted across his mind. Ma'am tucking the blankets around his chin as she whispered Psalm 139. If I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. Drawing a long, deep breath, Devin waited, then remembered the rest. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like day, for the darkness is as light to you. Your hand will guide me, Lord, Devin whispered. Your right hand will hold me fast. With comfort deep in his heart, he pushed the dangers that lay behind and ahead out of his mind. As if resting in his bed at home, Devin drifted off to sleep. Hours later, he woke to the sound of the sea. Though still on the hollow of the rock, he felt as if he were running from someone. As he listened to the waves wash against the shore, Devin tried to figure it out. What woke me, he wondered. He wasn't sure, but he knew one thing. He and Jeremy needed to be on their way. Devin didn't understand why. He just knew that nothing else seemed important. Gray mist hung over the water. In the half light before dawn, Devin found his shoes. Leaning over, he spoke softly. Jeremy, wake up. Together, they ate the last of the bread and cheese. Soon after they set out, the skies opened and cold rain slashed down upon them. With the mist of Ireland coming and going all morning, they were soaked through. The road grew soft and my, by midday, Devin's stomach rumbled with hunger. As he and Jeremy passed through a forest, they walked a short distance into the trees. When Devin sat down to rest, he looked at his shoes. His right foot was wet, and the sole of that shoe had a strange, jagged tear. Devin felt concerned. He had no money and could not possibly reach home before the shoe gave out completely. Then Devin shrugged. When compared with everything else that had happened, it didn't seem important. If needed, he could walk barefoot. But how cold would it be by the time they reached the Wicklow Mountains? In that moment, Jeremy turned to him. Where do you think Bree is right now? I don't know, Devin answered. Then he did know. Deep inside, he felt a warning, a nudge to pray. We're on the way home, he told Jeremy. Good Irish folk will help us. If we just keep walking, we'll see our families again. But I'm scared about Bree. Jeremy nodded. Something's wrong. Even more wrong, I mean. Devin agreed. Let's pray for her. Whatever was happening, he felt sure that Brie was in the worst danger of her life. Thank you for joining us for chapters 15 and 16. Um, I hope that you can come back next week and you'll hear chapters 17 and 18. Have a good night.